So one of the particularly interesting things, again, about magnetic fields is that we can create magnetic fields with electric currents, like we said. An electric current is a, a magnet, and we have observed the reason why we know electric fields are like magnets is because if we put a, I'm sorry, the reason why we know that, I'm not sure what I just said, the reason why we know that um, currents, current carrying wires, are magnets is because if we put them in magnetic fields, they feel a force. And the fact that they feel a force means that, that there's a magnetic force between the two. That means the wire must act like a magnet. The magnetic force on a current carrying wire on some arbitrary current carrying wire in some arbitrary direction can be measured. And just keep note that from now on, we will often draw current carrying wires without drawing the power source, right? Imagine that there is, that this is a closed circuit, right? If it's a current carrying wire, it's got to be a closed circuit. Uh, but we're only interested in the section of wire that we draw. So we can observe that the magnetic force on a current carrying wire it's been carefully measured, and the magnetic force is the magnetic force, right? A force on a current carrying wire is as follows. If we have some arbitrary magnetic field, let's just say we have some arbitrary magnetic field B that points in some arbitrary direction, and we've got some current carrying wire. I'll change the color of that wire, and we'll make the wire blue. And we've got some current carrying wire that has a current I, and it's got a length L, then we find, what we find, um, if we do some careful measurements, is that the magnetic force is due only to the perpendicular component of the magnetic field that is perpendicular to the wire. Uh, and it's important that this is a straight section of wire, right? This is a straight wire of length L. Um, and if we have a curved wire, we've got to break it up into little straight pieces and add them all up. So this is the magnetic force on a straight wire due to a magnetic field B. And it is equal to the current in the wire times the length of the wire times the perpendicular component of the magnetic field, right? The perpendicular component, which I'm trying to draw in here, of the magnetic field perpendicular, B perpendicular. That's the magnitude of the magnetic force. The direction of the magnetic force is given by the right-hand rule. The direction of the magnetic force is perpendicular to both I and B. So it is either into or out of the page, and it's given by the right-hand rule, where you point your fingers in the direction of L, and you rotate them in the direction of B, so in the direction of the current, I'm sorry, um, the direction of L is the direction of the current, but you point your fingers in the direction of the current and you rotate them towards the direction of B with your right hand. And so in this case, we will find that the direction of the magnetic force is into the page. Remember that a circle with a cross in it means into the page. So in general, the magnetic field due to a straight current carrying wire of length L with a current I is I L times the perpendicular component of the magnetic field and with the direction given by the right hand rule. We can rewrite this more compactly uh, into a vector equation with the cross product, right? Because if the angle between B and I, remember the angle between two vectors, the angle between B and I would be the angle between them when they're tail to tail. So the angle between B and I would be this angle. So the perpendicular component of the magnetic field is going to be B times the sine of theta, right? B times the cosine of theta would be the component parallel to I, so B times the sine of theta. So the magnetic force F sub B is going to be I L B times the sine of the angle between the current carrying wire and the magnetic field B with a direction given by the right-hand rule, and that is just the cross product, um, which I'll write on a new page. So we usually, I, I've been sort of varying between putting the direction on the current or the direction on the length, right? We actually can talk about vector lengths 
right? And vector, like we talk about vector areas, lengths and areas have directions. Um, so we usually put the direction on the length, but regardless, the current runs along the length. So either way, uh, the direction is the direction that the current runs along the length of the wire. And the notation is that the uh, magnetic force is I L cross B. And remember, that just means that the magnetic field force between the current carrying wire and the external magnetic field is ILB sine theta with a direction given by the right hand rule. It's going to be perpendicular to both the current carrying wire and the magnetic field um, with the appropriate direction given by the right hand rule. Notice that we can also therefore write the magnetic field of, I'm sorry, I keep saying field, the magnetic force on a charge moving in a magnetic field. So let's say that we've got a magnetic field and we've got a charge moving through the magnetic field. Let's say that we've got some region of constant magnetic field and let's say that that magnetic field is all coming out of the page. So I'm going to draw that as a bunch of uh, symbols coming out of the page. You don't really have to draw as many as I'm drawing here. But let's pretend we've got the magnetic fields coming out of the page. This is magnetic field. And let's say we have a charge that moves into this region of magnetic field. So we're going to shoot a charge. Let's take um, an electron and shoot that electron into the magnetic field. Because the electron is moving, let's give it a speed v. The electron is moving at speed v. In a, we're going to shoot it in a straight line, but it will move in a circ, uh, in a, in, it'll change its path in a second. Electrons moving at speed v, we shoot it into the magnetic field. That electron is the same as, a, moving electron is the same as a current, so it's going to feel a force. Um, now remember that the direction of a current is in the opposite direction that negative charges move, so the electron moving to the right is like a current moving to the left. So what is the direction of the force on the electron when it enters the field? So think about a current moving to the left and a magnetic field out of the page and the force, the magnetic force, is going to be equal to I L B. B is perpendicular to the current, so we don't have to worry about the perpendicular component. Um, I don't, uh, we haven't defined what I is yet, but we will do so in a second. And the direction is going to be given by the right-hand ru rule, where we take our fingers in the direction of I, and we rotate them towards B. Fingers in the direction of I, we rotate them towards B with our right hand. Which way does our thumb point? If, B is, if I is to the left and B is out of the page, then our thumb points up, so the force is upwards. So when the electron first moves into the magnetic field, the force is upwards. But now the electron is going to change direction. It's going to start moving upwards. And so then when will the force be? Notice that regardless of where the electron is moving, remember, the magnetic force is always going to be perpendicular to the current. It's always going to be perpendicular to its path. So the, if the electron starts to move upwards, then the force is still going to be perpendicular to its path, and it's going to continue making the electron moving, uh, changing its direction and it will make the electron move in some kind of arc, right? And if you guess correctly, you're going to see that the electron will move in a circle. So in a constant magnetic field, a moving charge will move in a circle because the magnetic force is always perpendicular to the path, right? It's a central seeking force. It's always going to be, it's a centripetal force, so it's always going to make the charge move in a circle. So what about the magnitude of that force? Well, the magnitude of that force, uh, we haven't defined what the current would be for a single charge moving at velocity v, so we need to do that. If Remember, if we want to talk about, uh, if the magnetic force is I, L, B, that is for uh, a straight, um, a, a current moving in a straight line. Well, this is only moving in a straight line for a moment before it changes direction, and then we can consider it moving in a straight line for a moment before it changes direction. So we can only consider this moving for a straight line for a distance dx. So instead of L, I'm going to change this to I dx times B, right? A small distance that it moves um, in a straight line. 
And since I is dq dt, dx times b, and dq is just a small piece of charge, and this is a single charge, so it's going to be q, and we can write dx dt times b. So the magnetic field on a charge that is moving at velocity v in a magnetic field b, in a, for now, a constant magnetic field b, is going to be q v velocity cross b. So F equals QV cross B is the same as IL cross B. They're the same thing. So let's just calculate some numbers to see uh, how this works out in real life. Let's just take things that we can access in the lab. Um, and let's say that we've got a current carrying wire, right? Like the straight, a straight wire that we have in class just as a demo. And let's say that I put a one amp current in it. One amp current in it. Let's say I put that in. A constant magnetic field it's not that it's not trivial to make a constant magnetic field but let's just say it's in a constant magnetic field that is perpendicular to the wire um, and let's say that we get a half tesla magnet and it's approximately constant what is the kind of force that we're talking about on this wire in other words what would happen if you took one of those neodymium magnets and you put it near the circuit that you're building in class is it going to feel a huge force is it going to move um, let's see what the magnitude of that force is. The magnitude of that force is I, which is, whoops, I, um, L cross B, or I, L, B, because they're perpendicular. We don't have to worry about the cross product. The magnitude is one amp. The length of the wire, let's just take a typical wire, which maybe is, um, a quarter of a meter. Whoops, the wrong number there. A uh, quarter of a meter and a half a Tesla. Whoops, I didn't leave myself enough space. Um, and so the force is about 0.25 times 5, 0.5, which is about 0.125 newtons. Remember, that's a pretty small force. It's not a negligible force, but it's a pretty small force. A reasonably large current of an amp uh, through a quarter meter of a wire uh, in a half Tesla field. It's about going to feel a, an eighth of a newton. So it's a relatively small force. It's not terribly noticeable. Uh, when it gets to be noticeable is when you've got extremely large currents or extremely large external magnetic fields. Then we start to worry about forces on current carrying wires in our circuits. Let's ask another uh, pretty straightforward question. Let's ask if we shoot an electron, let's take an electron, and we shoot it with a velocity of, I'm just going to make this up, um, let's say 10 to the fifth meters per second. That's not unreasonable. It's, electrons are very small. It's easy to get them to high speeds. We can, we've seen when we, we can accelerate them between plates, we can get them pretty fast. So let's say we shoot it with a velocity of 10 to the fifth meters per second into our constant magnetic field that we had drawn before, right? And then we're gonna ask for uh, what is the centripetal force on the electron? And we're gonna ask another question, which is, what is the radius of the circle that the electron will go in? Let me just draw a picture of the path of this electron. Right, the electron is going to, I'll make it in red. Uh, the electron is going to come into the field and then when it gets into the field, there's going to be a force, a magnetic force, which is perpendicular. And that's going to make the electron turn. And that magnetic force will continue to be perpendicular. And so the electron will continue to turn and so it's going to go in, whoops, I changed my colors. It's going to go in a circle in that magnetic field. And I want to know what the radius of that circle is. What's the magnitude of the force and what's the radius of that circle? Well, the force, the magnetic force, is going to have the magnitude of QVB. It is QVB sine theta, but theta in this case, because the velocity is always the velocity, right, uh, which is, let's make it a, what color do we want to make the velocity? Let's make it a purple vector, right? The velocity is always tangential to its path, and that is continually perpendicular to the magnetic field. So theta is always 90 degrees, and the sine of theta is 1 in this case. So the magnetic force is just QVB. 
and it's got a magnitude if the electron has a charge. So we're just talking magnitude, so absolute values, magnitude, absolute values. The electron has a charge of minus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. We're just going to take the absolute value of that to get the magnitude. The velocity is 10 to the fifth meters per second. And the magnetic field, whoops, I didn't give you a magnetic field. Let's just use the same one that we used in the last problem. Let's say that we've got an external magnetic field of half a Tesla. So we've got 0 0.5 Tesla. So the magnitude of that force is, it's 0 0.8 times 10 to the minus 14 Newtons. Now you might look at that and say, oh, well, that's negligible. But no, remember the electron is a very small, very small. It's, very, it's got a very small mass, so it's not negligible for something with that small a mass. Let's ask, so what, what is the radius of the circle? Well, the magnetic force is the centripetal force, right? The magnetic force is the centripetal force. It's the force that's making it go in a circle, and the centripetal force is v squared mv squared over r. Because it's making it go in a circle, then the magnetic force must equal the net force inward, which is mv squared over r. So therefore, we can solve for the radius of the circle that the electron is going to move in. Therefore, if I set QVB equal to mv squared over r, I'm not going to bother using the value that we calculated for, for magnetic force. We can just plug into this. Solve for r, the radius of the circle, right, r, the radius of the circle. Then r is equal to mv squared over QVB. One of the V's cancels, so it's MV over QB, MV over QB, and then we can go ahead and plug in R is the mass of the electron times the velocity, the speed of the electron divided by the charge of the electron uh, divided by the magnetic field. These are all absolute values. This is just the magnitude of R. So we get 9. 0.1 times 10 to the minus 31. Look up the mass of the electron. Google it. Ask Siri. 10 to the fifth meters per second divided by, again, absolute value. So I'm just going to write 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs times the magnetic field, which was a half a Tesla. All of this is MKS units, so it better work out to be meters. So that gives us a uh, radius of the circle of 11.3 times 10 to the minus 7, or 1.13 microns, micrometers. 10 to the minus 6 meters, micrometers. So before I end the, end the talk for today, I just want to, um, that's really all I want to do, but I do want to just talk, go back and, and mention a few things. First of all, the origin of the magnetic field. What is the origin of the magnetic field in a permanent magnet? In an electromagnet, the origin of the magnetic field is a charge moving in a circle, I'm sorry, a charge moving or current, right? So the, the origin of the magnetic field actually, when we, talk, when we think of a permanent magnet, we don't think of charges moving. When I hand you a bar magnet in the lab, there's no current flowing in it. You don't feel a current, you don't get a shock, right? But what is the origin of the magnetic field? The origin of the magnetic field in a bar magnet, in the neodymium magnets that, that we're playing with, is the fact that there are charges in these in these things and these charges are moving and all of those little charges are moving in little circles and they all act like little bar magnets um, and so there's all these little magnet, magnetic dipoles right we named these before magnetic dipoles in a material so in a solid material we've got all these what I'm trying to draw here charges moving in a circle charges moving in a circle and each of those has some orientation and each one acts like a little bar magnet. And they're not necessarily in any particular orientation. So the origin of the magnetic field is, even in a permanent magnet, it's moving charges. Now, we have to be careful about the description because classically we think of charges in an atom as moving in a circle, right? Electrons orbit the nucleus. But quantum mechanically, it's certainly more complicated than that. But quantum mechanically, an electron still has a di an electric dipole moment. It's got an, it, it is an electric dipole. So it acts like these little bar magnets. So every single electron and every single atom acts like a little bar magnet. 
So the origin of the magnetic field comes from the fact that there are charges, there are charges in atoms that have dipole moments. Um, and so now if you have a, a, a permanent, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, this, I, drew, I wrote permanent magnet, but this could be any material. This could be any material. It doesn't have to be a permanent magnet. They all have these little dipoles that move. In a permanent magnet, what happens is we line up all the little dipoles. All the little dipoles are lined up in the same direction. And that's what, and all those little dipole magnets add up to be a permanent magnet. So if we can line up the, mag, the, the dipoles, permanent magnet, if we can line up the dipoles, um, and then, then we can, and, and they stay aligned, that's what a permanent magnet is. Sometimes in a material, you will go ahead and you will line up the magnets, the little magnets, and then, but how do you line them up? How do you line up the magnets? How do you magnetize a permanent magnet? A permanent magnet might come magnetized, but you should be aware that you can create a permanent magnet, right? Have you ever taken a paper clip and taken a bar magnet and rubbed that bar magnet on the paper clip and then the paper clip itself becomes a magnet? At least it becomes a permanent magnet for a short time. Sometimes it doesn't last very long. And so what you've done is you've lined up all the dipoles. That's what you've done is you lined up all the dipoles. Oops, there we go. So if you find a permanent magnet, it has is something in which it, it has the dipoles all lined up. If you create a permanent magnet, you've lined up the dipoles by putting it in an external magnetic field and making them line up and they stay lined up. Sometimes you have a material, let's say, uh, like a piece of aluminum, where you can put it in an external magnetic field and you can line up all your dipoles, but then you take that external field out and all those dipoles just move again and de-align, right? And that's the diamagnet and paramagnet that we talked about. A diamagnet and a paramagnet, when you put them in an external magnetic field, external magnetic field, you can make the dipoles all line up, but when you take away the external magnetic field, they de-align. So that would be a uh, diamagnet, diamagnet or a paramagnet. And in one case, they line up with the field. In the other case, they line up opposite the field. But in the diamagnet and the paramagnet, once you take away that external field, they will no longer be lined up. In a permanent magnet, you can put an external field in to line up all your magnetic dipoles, make them all line up, and then you take away the magnetic field and they stay lined up. That's a ferromagnet. So the origin of the magnetic field in uh, materials is this is the fact that there are all these little um, magnetic dipoles that are inside the, the material and you can line up those magnetic dipoles. Sometimes those are called magnetic domains. The magnetic dipoles, the dipole itself is not a domain, but an area uh, with a bunch of dipoles in it are called domains. Um, and we line up the magnetic domains, uh, but it's the same idea. The last thing that I want to come back to is the fact that uh, magnetic poles cannot be isolated. And I put two, two question marks next to this because it's not really that they cannot be isolated. It's that we haven't figured out, we haven't, very, well, let's just say we haven't figured out a way to isolate magnetic dipoles. What I mean by that is you take a magnetic dipole, you take a, a permanent magnet, a bar magnet that you find in any third grade classroom, and you break it in half, and all you do is you get two smaller magnets. You break that in half, each of those in half, and you get four smaller magnets. You can never break the south pole away from the north pole. Each time you break it in half, it just turns into another south pole and a north pole. In practice, in our experience, magnets only come as dipoles. The single poles, the north pole and the south pole, do not exist separate from each other. That is not really, there's nothing in physics that says that they shouldn't be separate from each other. It's just that we haven't really found a way for them to be separate from each other, right? Now, again, that's not even really true because there are some really far out experiments where they claim they've isolated magnetic monopoles, right? The single poles, the north and the south pole. Um, but in practice, it, it, we really can't, we, we really haven't we haven't permanently been able to um, keep, have a, we, you don't have a magnet, um, a magnetic pole like a magnetic, like a, uh, an electric charge 
where you can separate these two poles from each other and, and have them interact with each other. You, you always have a north and a south pole together. Um, so this concept of magnetic monopoles, a single pole, a north pole separated from a south pole, them being independent of each other, the concept exists. It's not something that's not allowed by physics, but in practice, um, in a, in, in, except for in some very unusual experiments, uh, we haven't found way, we haven't found naturally in nature separate poles like we have found separate charges. So what do you call a penguin in a desert? Lost. What's black, white, black, white, black, white, black, white? A penguin rolling down a hill. 